I want to thank all of you for inviting me here. This is my mea culpa, because I was supposed to be here <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. And um, so please help yourself to the sandwiches. They really are good. I didn't make them, so I can tell you that. <laughs> they are from Jimmy John's in Wichita, and they do make wonderful sandwiches. And they're all just little bite-sized ones. So you can have more than one and not be a piggy. Um, on some of the seats, I left um, one of these uh, little handouts that are medications used in ALS most commonly. And for the nursing staff, um, this might be handy for you uh, to at least know when you see these that these are absolutely workable in ALS. So if, there, if you don't have one and you want one, I'm going to leave them up here on the table. Just help yourself. And also, I would like you to help yourself to the ALS bracelets. I put some on the chairs, but um, it's just a little reminder to, for all of us to keep working to try to stamp out ALS. A little bit about myself, just so you know, I didn't just wander off of the highway. Um, <laughs> I have been doing this, I'm a nurse, an old nurse, <laughs> and I have been doing this with the ALS Association now, this is my 16th year, and I have noticed phenomenal changes in the 16 years that I have been with them. Um, the Ice Bucket Challenge has really helped. Uh, it, it has helped us to open two more clinics in Missouri, one that we have slated for Nebraska, one that we have slated for uh, Wichita. And we already have one at University of Nebraska Medical Center, one at KU Medical Center. We have two in Missouri that we just recently opened. and. Um, we are hoping to incorporate those from Oklahoma. And I was telling Crystal, along with following 82 different people here, from Emporia to the Colorado state line, all who have ALS, uh, I am also their intake nurse. So I do the intakes for all four states. So it keeps our office just a little bit busy. But to give you a little bit of background, and I hope I don't bore you completely, but um, let me get through this. I'll go through it kind of quickly, and then it's wide open for any questions any of you might have. Um, to start with, what is ALS? It's called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, otherwise known as Lou Gehrig's disease. It is progressive. It's a fatal neurodegenerative disorder. It is death of the motor neurons which cause progressive muscle weakness, atrophy, and paralysis of the voluntary muscles. The incidence of ALS is two per every 100,000 population per year. Each year, and it's interesting, these statistics don't vary. Each year, 5,600 new cases are diagnosed in the United States, and 30,000 Americans may have the disease at any given time. Every 90 minutes, someone is diagnosed with ALS, and the reason that our statistics don't vary is that every 90 minutes, someone succumbs to the disease. One in every 50 families is affected by ALS in the United States. 300,000 people alive today in the United States will develop and die with ALS. 90% of what we see is what we call sporadic, and 10% is familial. And you may think, well, what are the risk factors for this disease? Aging is one, gender is one. 60% are males, 40% are females. The average age, although it really runs the gamut of age, I have had people as 
old as 85 develop ALS. And we had a little gal in Missouri a couple years ago as young as 16. But the average age <clears throat> is 50 to 55. The sad thing is military service is a real risk factor. Anyone that has been in active duty anywhere in the world for 90 days or more are two to one going to develop ALS over the general population. Other potential factors are smoking, viral infections, exposure to environmental toxins, and head and spinal trauma. The life expectancy is two to five years after diagnosis. If someone has slow progression, 15 to 25 percent <coughs> with ALS live 10 years after they first notice initial symptoms. In rapid progression, respiratory failure within a year is not unusual. What are the types of onset? Well, there's actually a couple. Well, a little bit more than a couple. Limb onset, which is either upper or lower, Fasciculation or twitching of the muscles in drop foot, tripping over carpet, weak hands, carpal tunnel, those are all either upper or lower limb onset. And then we have bulbar onset, problems with speaking, chewing, and swallowing. Respiratory onset, which usually goes along with bulbar, which is problems with shortness of breath, sleep and fatigue, and trunk onset, which is unable to hold the body upright. In bulbar onset, we have found that 50% of our folks have frontotemporal dementia, which is word finding and poor decision making. There's no clinical or lab test to identify ALS. The diagnosis is generally made through a careful examination of medical history and neurological examination. Routine tests to assist in establishing the diagnosis of ALS include EMG, muscle biopsy, x-rays, blood tests, urine tests, spinal taps, and pulmonary function tests. The diagnostic criteria is that upper and lower motor neuron signs in bulbar in two spinal regions gives the diagnosis of ALS, or upper and low, lower motor neuron signs in three spinal regions gives the definite diagnosis of ALS. Probable ALS, which also is a progressive disease, but it also only involves upper and lower lower motor neuron signs in two regions instead of three. PLS is primary lateral sclerosis, which involves the upper motor neurons only. PMA, these are all variations of ALS. PMA is progressive muscular atrophy, which involves lower motor neurons only, and PBP is progressive bulbar palsy, and that involves the speaking and swallowing areas. They all eventually do go to ALS. What are the principles of ALS management? Well, the highest priority on patient self-determination or autonomy in the therapeutic relationship. In other words, to involve the patient with everything that's going on in their disease progression. Patients and families need information that is timed appropriately and well in advance of major medical crossroads. Healthcare professionals should address the full continuum of care for the ALS patient, and advanced directives should be introduced and re-evaluated every six months. So, what's the treatment? Well. Currently, the only FDA-approved drug to slow the progression of the disease is Rilutec. It can extend life expectancy an average of three months. 
the average cost is $2,000 a month. So consequently, not every insurance company is going to pay for that. And even if you have Medicare and your Plan D for supplemental medical uh, coverage, many of them have really high deductibles. I will tell you one thing that we have found as clinicians in the field is that the antioxidant vitamins, A, C, E, beta carotene, CoQ10, work almost the same as the Rillutech. With Rillutech being as expensive as it is, an awful lot of folks elect not to take it. And those that do take it, only about 50% of those that take it will have any effect at all from it. The symptom management is providing management of the patient's symptoms rather than curing the disease and focusing on our quality of life. ALS has a hypermetabolic nature. In other words, weight loss in ALS results from loss of muscle mass, decreased intake, and energy cost of activities. Suboptimal caloric and fluid intake causes a worsening of muscle atrophy, weakness, and fatigue. The common symptoms include jaw weakness and fatigue, drooling, choking on food or fluid, and slow eating. It really takes a lot of energy to eat, whether you realize it or not. And so when you find that someone is taking three or four times as long as the average person to finish a meal, then you really have to look at how much. I did that too. <laughs> uh, uh, you really have to look at um, how difficult is it for them to eat and what's going on. We, uh, we do know that decreased caloric intake and loss of weight does make this disease go faster. So I know it's impossible to tell a woman not to lose weight that um, every woman that I know wants to lose that excess 10 pounds, um, but we tell everyone, please don't lose weight because the loss of weight does make the disease go faster. Um, we want <clears throat> a consult with a speech and language pathologist and a dietitian. And one of the dietary modifications is to use a thickening agent in liquids and it, one of the ones that are out there is called Thicket, or Simply Thick. You can get it at any drugstore. It's a little bit like putting um, unflavored gelatin in your liquid. Um, not everybody really likes to do that. I have found that um, if you go to the grocery store, they do carry little cans of nectar apricot and peach nectar, and if you add that to water, there's just enough thickening agent in it that people don't choke as easily. Also, um, another little hint is we usually try to get folks, if they can do it, to use a straw in a whatever they're drinking. And I'll tell you why, and if you can kind of visualize this, it makes it a little bit more sense. If you have a glass of water or a cup of coffee or something like that and you lift it up to your mouth, your tendency is to tip your head back a little bit when you're drinking. That opens two things. It opens the flap that goes into your esophagus that runs down into your stomach. It also opens the other flap that goes into your trachea which leads to your lung. And if that's open and food or fluid slips into your lung, that causes extreme coughing. If you put a straw in something, your tendency is to take your head <clears throat> to your chest and go towards the straw. And in that position, that closes the flap to the trachea or to the lung, and it leaves the flap open to the stomach or to the esophagus. So therefore, it really, there's a lot less chance of anyone choking.
drinking that way. Just a low hint. Um, there is an I Can't Chew cookbook that's out there by Randy Wilson, Soft and Pureed Ideas. We do want people to increase the calories and protein content of their foods. And Ensure, Boost, and Carnation Instant Breakfast is a good way to do that. When is a PEG tube indicated? The presence of inadequate oral intake and diminished quality of life due to choking rather than the result of a swallowing study indicates that a percutaneous endoscopy uh, uh, gastric tube or PEG tube is indicated. When the force vital capacity or the ability to breathe in and breathe out falls to 50% of predicted, um, that is also an indicator of putting in a feeding tube. And if they're not in the preterminal phase of the disease, and symptomatic dysphagia or inability to chew with accelerated weight loss due to insufficient calorie intake, dehydration, or ending of meals prematurely, those are all reasons to put in a feeding tube. The interesting thing is where it says um, if your force vital capacity or your ability to breathe in and breathe out is at 50% or lower, it's that the anesthesiologist who puts you into kind of a little twilight sleep for the only 10 minutes it takes to put that feeding tube in, they will not give you the anesthesia. So therefore, you're no longer qualified to get a feeding tube. So if you are thinking about getting one and if you start losing your ability to um, take in enough calories to really count, um, the idea is to get it prior to your forced vital capacity going to 50% of predicted or lower. Also, if you are thinking about going on to hospice, because even though um, getting a, a feeding tube is an outpatient procedure or short-term uh, uh, surgery procedure, hospice doesn't really want to pay for it. They get paid just X amount of dollars every day, whether they see you or whether they don't. And it's kind of expensive as soon as you involve an anesthesiologist or a an, uh, surgical area. So we also always suggest, if you're thinking about getting a feeding tube, do it before you decide to go on to hospice. It's not to say it can't be done, but the method of doing it isn't really too kosher. In other words, if you are already on hospice and then you decide you want a feeding tube, we suggest that you revoke hospice for 24 hours, get your Medicare back, go in and have the procedure, and then come back out and readmit to hospice. That's not really the way the best things run, but it can be done that way. Early indications of respiratory insufficiency is shortness of breath or dyspnea on exertion, supine dyspnea, in other words, laying flat in bed that you're unable to breathe, marked fatigue, disturbed sleep or frequent nocturnal awakenings, excessive daytime sleepiness, and morning headaches. And the reason for that is if you are not breathing as you should or as is adequate and you are not blowing off your carbon dioxide as you're taking in oxygen from the air, when you wake up in the morning, you're most likely to have a headache because of the buildup of carbon uh, monoxide in, or carbon dioxide in your brain. So that is one of the early indications of respiratory insufficiency. Um, what's the best test for detecting early signs of impending respiratory failure? Uh, if the maximal inspiratory pressure, it's the most sensitive. Erect sittings for more for spinal capacity um, if they drop below 50 into the 40s and possibly supine for spinal capacity. In other words, if they are starting to drop down below 50 in the sitting position and you put someone in a reclining position, they most likely will drop into the 30s. 
uh, nocturnal oximetry and evaluating the nocturnal hypoventilation. And full poly, uh, polysomnography uh, is rarely indicated. Um, the force vital capacity less than 25 to 30 percent of predicted indicates significant risk of impending respiratory failure and death. Does non-invasive ventilation improve respiratory function or increase survival? Yes, it does. <clears throat> it increases survival more effectively um, it, in Invasive ventilation or being on a ventilator really increases survival most effectively, but with a greater financial and care burden on the patient and the family. It's very, very difficult when someone goes on to um, a ventilator because you must have 24 hour a day care and all of those caregivers have to be um, trained in how to run the ventilator and what to do in case of failure of the vent. So it becomes very pricey to do that. Um, we do put people on either the BiPAP or the Trilogy. And um, let me explain a little bit. The BiPAP um, is just hooked to room air. You breathe in and breathe out, but the machine is actually doing it for you. Where CPAP, for people that are overweight, many people are on CPAP machines, that just forces air into your lung and you have to blow it out. A BiPAP forces air in, but then it pulls it back out. And so it keeps the continuity of what's going in and what's going out. The newer model is called a Trilogy which is really kind of neat. It is almost classed as an external ventilator in that it is, um, it is hooked to the patient's demand. So as the demand varies with the person, the machine varies along with them. And we are using it more and more as they are coming out of clinics. Patients that want long-term ventilator support, um, both patients and families must understand the benefits and the burdens of this decision, the cost, the amount of care needed, and possible nursing facility placement. I will tell you right now, I don't believe there is any nursing facility in the state of Kansas that will take a ventilator-dependent patient, um, which is kind of a shame, but that's the truth. So. I do know in my caseload, I have three ventilator dependent patients, but we have had to train their family and, um, and others who have volunteered to take care of them so that all the care is being done at home because there is no nursing care placement. It is really a heavy burden on the families. Um, in accordance with the principle of patient autonomy, um, physicians should respect the right of the patient with ALS to refuse or withdraw any treatments, including mechanical ventilation. And when withdrawing ventilation to use adequate opiates or anxiolytics to relieve dyspnea or shortness of breath and anxiety. In other words, people do go on, they do get trached and vented. I have one such fellow right now who is, um, He's a wonderful guy. I've had him now for 14 years. He is um, an aeronautical engineer in Wichita. He's young, he's in his 40s, and he wanted to live long enough to help raise his son, who was not even crawling when I first got him. And uh, he now is very tired, and he wants off the ventilator. He's also from Maine, so he is raising money to get back to Maine so that they can gradually withdraw him off of the ventilator and he can die in peace in his own home state. A lot of people do decide that they don't want to be on the ventilator any longer and, um, and it's difficult to make the decision to withdraw. Other symptom management um, issues are saliorrhea or excessive saliva 
and the pseudobulbar affect, which happens to people that are um, more bulbar oriented. In other words, um, if their area that is being affected is in their lungs and in their breathing area, many times they have also pseudobulbar affect, which is in the frontotemporal dementia of the brain. And they have either excessive laughter, where something that might be mildly humorous becomes ridiculous and they can't stop laughing and it becomes louder and funnier and funnier and funnier and it's almost contagious the way that works or excessive crying that they um, the least little thing even a, a, an ad on TV can set them off and they will start crying there is a drug that will affect that and will stop it in its tracks um, the other thing are cognitive and behavioral impairments, and sometimes we do find that um, people's personality does seem to change, and so sometimes that's a little bit difficult to work with. Depression and anxiety, there is a level of depression that is in this disease itself. So someone may never have had depressive qualities before. But don't feel bad if you develop a little depression with the disease because it's part of the disease and, and it can be treated with antidepressants. Spasticity and cramps, fatigue, dysarthria, and mobility issues are all things that we look at. Saliaria, the excess saliva. There is a pharmacological intervention called glycopyrrolate. It also goes by the name Robinol. It's um, a pill taken by mouth. It's very effective. Amitriptyline is also used. Scopolamine patches are used once every three days. Those are the little patches that go behind the ear, especially if you tend to have motion sickness and you're going on a cruise. It's recommended that you get one of those because then you won't get sick but it also decreases saliva, and so we use it frequently to decrease saliva. And atropine, interestingly enough, ophthalmic. Ophthalmic means it's for the eye, but you don't put it in the eye. You put it under the tongue, and just a couple of drops under the tongue will just absolutely get rid of saliva. And then there's also type B Botox. And those are really for the intractable cases. However, um, we have been known to send patients to KU. There is an expert in Botox injections. They inject three of the four submandibular um, glands, and it dries them up, leaves one open so that they still produce a little bit of saliva, but it cuts the excess of saliva way, way down and non-pharmacologic treatments are suction machines. Um, well, I told you about the pseudobulbar effect or emotional ability of some of the patients. <coughs> Excuse me, 50% of those with um, uh, problems in their brain Nudexta is the drug that is used, and, and it does control that really, really nicely. So what are the psychosocial impacts of the disease? Well, it is a fatal illness. As of this year, in 2015, it is still a fatal illness, um, and it is progressive. So. I don't know how you all react to losing things and losing people in your life, but these folks are losing their abilities inch by inch and day by day. It's very frustrating. It's very difficult for them to contend with that. And um, the quality of life is the most important thing to keep in mind in taking care of these folks. They ultimately are going to need assistance with all of their daily activities, their personal care. Um, 
their ability to continue with employment, some of them can do employment for quite a while, um, remaining physically and emotionally independent is really important to these folks and coping with physical and emotional losses. In other words, I have to let go of who I am and focus on who I will become. Such uh, as mobility, communication, and control over their own faculties, role in their family and their spousal relationship. And when patients live at home, it's very difficult to maintain the husband-wife relationship and not have it the patient and caregiver relationship. Grieving, they do grieve this loss. No matter how small it may seem to you or I, the grieving is really, um, it's really paramount, both by the patient and by the family members. And decisions of health care end of life decisions, whether or not they do want a feeding tube, whether or not they do want to be on a respirator. Estate planning and providing for family in the future and the financial impact. The average cost to an ALS patient is $200,000 per year, which includes cost of medicine, around the clock care, equipment, special devices, and lost wages. Depression and anxiety, there is a, a period of adjustment to the diagnosis, and um, your primary care physician can usually suggest drugs that will help adjust. Um, assistance by the social worker and the neurologist at the multidisciplinary clinic every three months, and I know that people that live out this far, until we get a clinic up and running in Wichita, it's a little hard for them to go all the way to Kansas City. But we're working on it, and I'm hoping that before the end of 2016, we'll have a multidisciplinary clinic in Wichita, so you won't have to drive as far. Encourage coping strategies, staying as involved as possible, in their hobbies and their social interactions. There are some um, drugs for pharma the pharmaceutical intervention, um, such as Xanaflax and Baclofen. Range of motion exercises, these all help in spasticity and cramps. And cramping usually lessens as the disease progresses, and the reason for that is as the motor neurons die, and they're no longer agitated, then the spasticity and the cramps usually lessen. Fatigue should be avoided at all costs, and um, the goal is to maintain their current activity and mobility rather than rehabbing improvements because once the muscles are no longer being enervated by the motor neurons, you can't bring them back. So there isn't really any rehabbing to this disease. But maintaining current activity and keeping the muscles that are not involved up to speed um, is really important. And focus on how the patient would like to spend their time. What are their priorities with their limited energies per day? Learning methods of making tasks easier and pacing themselves alternate activities with periods of rest, regular sleeping patterns and napping patterns, and maintaining nutritional requirements. When um, the speech is affected, it's called dysarthria, and you can notice it by the slurring of words, and especially the more fatigued the person gets, their voice usually gets more hoarse, it's more breathy, and it is harder for them to speak, and consequently their words are slurred. Referral to a speech and language pathologist may start techniques like slowing down their speech or exaggerating articulation of sounds. Um, but I brought something which I think my little friend might like. 
It's called, and we use these often, it's called a boogie board. And it has a stylist. And if they can still use their hands, you can write on here any kind of a message that you want to show to people. And then press the little button and it disappears and you have a clean slate again. So that is one thing that, that we use and I will leave this here with you all. We also work with the Toby Dynavox people. And once you're in a nursing home, your Medicare is not going to pay for a speech generating device. However, we do have loan closets. And each one of us nurses has our own loan closet. And we do have some of these uh, available. And so um, if it is needed, what I do then is call the Toby Dynavox people out and they go over the equipment that I have and what they feel the patient can use. And if they can no longer use their hands, then we put them on an eye gaze system where their eyes can trap what they want to say and it can hit a little button and it will actually speak for them. So that's kind of helpful. And we do have some of those in our loan closet. Uh, assistive equipment plays a major role in the lives of persons with ALS to maintain their independence. And an occupational therapist uh, should be involved in their care so that they can help with their short-term and long-term needs. We have built up utensils. We have button hooks and zipper pulls. We have two-handle cups and key guards, elastic and Velcro versus button and zipper mechanisms where you can zip your pants up, uh, a universal cuff, and um, different kinds of reachers and doorknob turners, and um, not least of all, a bidet. If someone loses their ability with their hands, that we do have bidets that we can put on, on the toilet so that they're kept clean. Um, in lower limb onset patients, we have canes and walkers, um, wheelchairs, shower chairs, lift chairs, commodes, to toilet risers, slide boards or pivot discs, sit to stand or Hoyer lifts, and power wheelchairs. So um, there are a lot of things that we do have in our loan closet. Um, being 100% um, that we're nonprofit, so we charge for nothing. If you need something out of our loan closet, it is yours if we've got it for as long as you need it and can use it. And the only thing that we ask is when you're through using it that we get it back. It's really important that people get to a multidisciplinary clinic, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we don't have a clinic close enough to you to avail yourself of it. We do have one in Nebraska. We do have one in Kansas City. There's also one in Denver. Um, and the reason that that is so important, we have found that people that can get to the multidisciplinary clinic actually do better. Um, in that clinic is a neurologist, the neuromuscular specialist, uh, the RN case manager and physical therapist and occupational therapist, speech and language, uh, pathologist, the dietitian, the social worker, the respiratory therapist, our ALSA liaison, and a neuropsychologist. So they all um, give their opinions as to how you can stay as independent as possible for as long as possible. Um, it gives the emotional support to the patient. It gives them encouragement um, how to communicate with the other healthcare providers, especially those uh, in their home. Um, and then comes the question of when do you tr uh, transfer someone to hospice services and hospice referral? The patient or family asks or opens the door for end of life information or interventions. That's one way it's a trigger for hospice referral. 
Severe psychological or social or spiritual distress or suffering is another. Pain, although ALS is not considered a painful disease, some people do have pain. And pain requiring opiates uh, is another trigger for hospice referral. Uh, requiring a feeding tube, shortness of breath, or hypoventilation with the forced vital capacity below 50% and loss of function in two body regions. Um, the end of life issues or hospice considerations are support of the patient and family. Comfort measures, um, if they're on pain medications, it's the addressing of constipation and what to do about it, hydration and nutrition, their skin condition and their respiratory condition. Um, supporting the patient towards their continual loss and their fear of dying. What will the end of life and death be like? And I'm going to tell you that um, in, in reading things on the internet, sometimes it gives people the wrong impression that, you're, uh, that a patient with ALS is going to suffocate or choke to death, and that is not ever, ever going to happen. We put hospice in place with all of our folks towards the end and hospice people know how to manage the death and dying aspect um, by chemically balancing them and it is a very gentle transition from this life to the next. Um, the assessing of, of need of antidepressant or anti-anxiety anti medications if they're not already in use. Uh, the fear and isolation, the anger and frustration, and confronting one's own mortality. Um, so these are all things that, um, are, that hospice does look at. Uh, comfort measures that can be taken are massage therapy, showers and baths for as long as possible, range of motion, and don't underestimate the help of music therapy because music really is uh, a great therapy. Um, so are there any questions? I don't know if I've hit on everything that comes to your mind or not. Yes? Um, I, sorry, I can't remember the name of the device where you use your eyes to... The eye gaze system? The eye gaze system. Uh -huh. Does that have like a... Does that have like an extension like holder for it? Yes. How does that, okay. Yes, it does. Okay. And, and it usually either, um, either it is on a stand, which say rolls so that you can place it under underneath the bed. Okay. And so it's in front of the patient's face or it attaches to a wheelchair, either one way or the other. Looks like a little tablet. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then the eye gaze system, you, we can either place it directly on the lane, or they have a headband that they can wear, or some glasses that they'll attach to. Yeah, and sometimes there's just a little silver dot that's placed right here between the eyes, and there's a camera that will focus on that, and then it, uh, the eyes actually, the eyes become the mouse. If any of you are I'm not computer literate, <laughs> I'm not the one to ask, but uh, uh, it, do, it does become the virtual mouse, so that as you move your head, so the mouse moves. And, and it really isn't that difficult to get used to. In fact, um, the fellow that I told you that wants to come off of the ventilator and go to Maine to pass his life with his uh, uh, family members up in Maine, he has been on the eye gaze system for over six years. He's been completely locked in where nothing works except his eyeballs. And he can type faster with his eyes in that eye gaze system than I can with two hands. Oh, wow. So, um, amazing. well, and the, the really amazing thing, his, the other part of his story, which really I think is phenomenal is that a couple of years ago, um, Toyota uh, had their, um, what's it called? 
the car race for um, pardon? Indy 500. Well, no, it's kind of like the Indy 500, but it's it's smaller cars, and they had the um, they had a a deal where they opened it up to everybody in the United States to design a race car. And um, he designed the winning race car out of hundreds of thousands of entries. And he did it all with his eyes and won. And so Toyota came to Wichita and picked he and his son up and flew them to Phoenix, Arizona for three days to go to the races. And, um, and then when he came back, they flew them back, they awarded him a handicapped van. It's, I think it's like a 46 or $48,000 van. So that was really cool. <laughs> and, but those are things that can be done with just your eyes. So, and the thing that we never want to see is for anyone to lose their ability to communicate. I think that is the greatest loss of all is when... They're trapped inside of your body. Right, right. You're trapped inside your body and when there's nothing the matter with your brain, but you can't get your thoughts out to share them with your family members. That is really, um, to me, the greatest loss. So we work very, very hard to try to keep people um, maintaining their ability to communicate with others. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions at all? So at this stage where Elaine is at right now, what would, what would the next step be for her? She's struggling to, I'm sorry, was there someone else asking a question? Uh, I don't know. Uh, okay. No, this fly up here doesn't have too many oh, questions. He's just inquisitive, but he doesn't have much to say. <laughs> I guess I just wonder what would be most helpful for her right now. At this well, stage. we want her to be able to communicate with everybody here, for one thing, along with her family. And um, so, you know, I'm going to leave this boogie board with her so that she can at least use what she does have in the way of mobility of her hands to write with. Um, and, and you can even write with your fingernail. I mean, you don't have to hold a stylus to write. You can use anything at all, You're, just your finger is fine. Um, and then, uh, from that point on, it would be to see whether or not we've got an eye gaze system in one of our loan closets and to have the Dynavox Toby representative come out and fit her with it and teach her how to use it. Which I think, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but I think um, at least it will keep her able to communicate with everybody. Right, and you could provide her an in-service as well as the staff an in-service on how to how to assist her and right. understand the communication that will be coming from that. Right. I fit a couple MS patients back in Kansas City with it, and it works beautifully. It does work beautifully. That's so. Good to know. I need to know about that. Yeah. If you're not in a nursing home, if you're at home, there's no problem. Um, then there's no problem getting it because your Medicare and your supplemental insurance will buy it for you, or it will rent. It will rent it for 13 months, and then on the 14th month, you have purchased it. So um, there's no problem. But being in a nursing home or on hospice, either one or the other, um, because, like especially for hospice, the only way I can describe hospice adequately is it's like giving your wallet to somebody else and they decide what they're gonna pay out of that wallet. Um, you've given your Medicare over to them and they decide what you're gonna get out of that. Well, hospice um, only gets paid, they get paid per diem, which is per day, and they only get so much money per day for all the services that they can provide for you. And consequently, um, they have to be very careful with what they're purchasing. 
and um, the rental on these eye gaze systems is pretty steep and they can't afford it. But that's why we usually try to keep some in our loan pool so that we can loan them out and fit them to patients when they need them and when they're in a position where their insurance isn't going to cover it. So that's kind of where she, she is at this point and uh, we'll see what we can do for her. <laughs>